We are excited to announce Sean King. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والصلاة والسلام على سيد المرسل محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين. الحمد لله. Today we are absolutely blessed to be in Turkey uh, at a summit, at a prophetic summit. الحمد لله. And we have an amazing brother that has just agreed to do the podcast with us, uh, brother Sean King. Assalamu alaikum, my brother Sean King. Assalamu. I'm glad to be here, and uh, it's beautiful to be with two. I asked you. I was like, are you actually brothers? And said, oh yes, we're we are brothers. We are brothers. So, uh, I'm so excited yeah. that the two of you get to do this together and. Thank you for having me. Alhamdulillah, you. we're very blessed. Uh, I think you will be, inshallah, our 52nd episode. Beautiful. Uh, alhamdulillah, beautiful. we've been only going for one year. Alhamdulillah, we've just gone crazy, alhamdulillah, worldwide. So we can't complain. Alhamdulillah. It's all from his blessings. And alhamdulillah, we get to highlight our brothers and sisters' stories in their views and in their own ways, alhamdulillah. Amen. So this is your success story. This is your story, inshallah. And undoubtedly, mashallah, your advocacy and your work. There's no doubt about it in our hearts that it is success. So we'd love for you to share maybe your earlier stage uh, story. You know, where were you? Where did you start? Yeah, you know, where were you sure. born? What's the family like? Yeah, you know, uh, as soon as you ask me about success, it's funny. And, and this is not because I have a negative mindset. I have failed way more than I have succeeded. Yeah. And I, I, I immediately think of so many struggles and mistakes that I have made. And some of the best lessons I, I've ever learned were from those mistakes. And uh, there are times where I would make the same mistake over and over and over again and not squeeze the lesson out of it. I'm at the point in my life, uh, the camera may not see it, but my wife is here in the room <laughs> as we're talking. <laughs> She is, she's been with me since I was 16 years old. Love her. So she uh, unfortunately has seen all of the mistakes and some of those successes, but you will never succeed in life, in, in work, in marriage, in family without making mistakes and squeezing the lessons out of it. I mean, I mean. Um, so where were you born? Where, where? Tell Absolutely. Us. So I, I am from a tiny town in the American South, the deep South in Kentucky called Versailles, Kentucky. It looks like the word Versailles, like Versailles, Paris. Yes. But this place is uh, so we call it country. It's so country that they didn't call it Versailles. They called it Versailles. It's a, like a, a factory town. Uh, most of those factories have shut down. But my mother moved there in the 1970s to work at a light bulb factory. Wow. And uh, she was one of the first women to ever work in this factory. She worked there for over 40 years. She gave her whole life there. Really, uh, my mother was a single mother. No father? Yeah, so we had no father figure in our lives, me or my brother. Wow. And, uh, so neither, two siblings, only you yeah, and me Yeah, and, me and my older brother, who uh, unfortunately passed away, he was uh, a sweet soul. SubhanAllah. Uh, I, I tell the story so many times that uh, I, I, I was almost a man before I grew to love my brother. Love. Uh, he was always older than me. And he, and he and I were so radically different as kids. He never got in trouble. Uh, it was He was the sweetest, kindest soul his whole life. And I was always mischievous, always in trouble. So the troublemaker. Yo, oh, oh, Ned, uh, undoubtedly. Why? Uh, and, uh, why were you the troublemaker? I, well, I, I, don't, I don't know the source of why I, I did. <laughs> um, they say, SubhanAllah, they say a lot of the brothers and sisters that at a young age are naughty and you know are always challenging the status quo. Yeah. Always succeed in the in, in the future. Subhanallah. My mother, my mother raised the two of us very differently. He was her first child, and uh, but he seemed to be sweet by nature, and he was that way. Literally, I was with him the day he passed away, and uh, he got pancreatic cancer, and it took. My brother was a giant. We had different biological fathers, and so he was a a tall, big, strong man. And uh, pancreatic cancer is something when you have it, uh, I mean, when you, when you get diagnosed with it, you normally have already had it for a year. Yeah. And so he was diagnosed in August, and I think by the end of September, he passed away. Was he around seeing some of your successes? And yes, and uh, my, my brother was, was one of my biggest supporters. Uh, I... I miss him, and uh, even seeing the two of you made me think of him. But we, uh, we had the sweetest mother. My mother's still living. Uh, of course, she was devastated by his passing, but 
every day she's asking me how I'm doing in I Istanbul. Love Lisa. I, love Lisa. Uh, I just I was in uh, Germany yesterday in Berlin and Frankfurt speaking there. I would not be who I am without my mother. And uh, I, I've been I've been thinking much about my mother. So much of who I became as a man were from little lessons that my mother taught me. My mother wasn't religious, but my mother, when I was in first grade, it's, it's a goofy story, but it shaped me for whatever reason. I, I asked my mother to make sure this was true, if I was remembering this correctly. My mother asked me, my mother was overweight and she would not mind me saying this, okay? But my mother asked me, she said, Sean, are there any fat girls in your class? And this is first grade. And I told my mother, I said, yes. And uh, she said, if anybody mistreats th these, these, these girls, she said, you, you have to tell them that they're wrong. It's not, it's not okay. Those are bullies. Wow. And so when wow. I was in first grade, my mother was already kind of training my mind to stand up for people. Stand up, yeah, yeah. To stand up for so, so she was activating you to be an activist. I love she, didn't know, she, she didn't know it. <laughs> Because I've, I've had this conversation. My mother lives in Atlanta. Um, I had this conversation with her and I said, Mom, so much of who I became as an activist, as somebody who fought for people, so much of that came from these early lessons. All throughout elementary school, my mother would always tell me, Sean, if people are mistreating people, you have to tell them they're wrong. Even if they're your friends, Amen. tell them this. And wow. so uh, these little nuggets, it shaped me. Um, I have to tell both of you and, and for anybody who sees this now or may see it years from now, that town I grew up in almost broke me. Wow. And this town was, was and is deeply racist. And uh, this, this town growing up there, there was so much racism and discrimination there that when I got to high school, I started to face this bigotry right away. And I grew up in a way where in elementary school and what we call middle school or junior high school, I was like a universal friend to everybody. But when I got into high school, uh, which is in, in the United States, ninth, 10th, 11th and 12th grade, yep, yep. everybody got into their own cliques and they were mainly racial groups. And so I had universally gotten along with everybody and suddenly I was expected to pick a group. Well, if people see this now, uh, it's kind of a joke, but I am what we call ethnically ambiguous, where anywhere I go in the world, people think I'm them. So like here in Istanbul, I, I, we saw somebody who thought I was from Pakistan. Uh, <laughs> some, somebody else saw me and thought I was from Brazil. Mm. When I'm in the United States, we lived in Brooklyn. Jewish men and women would come up to me and speak Yiddish to me. I had grown my beard out and they thought I was Jewish. And so in, in this town, that was not cool. This was not popular. And I started facing racism and discrimination right away. So which, which group did you choose? Well, I, I made a choice, but the choice was also made for me. I, I became in this, this is in the mid nineties. You were either black or white. Love and wow. so I, I, my friends were black. I sat at the black table and instantly I lost almost all of my white friends. My ninth, my ninth grade year for the first time in my life, I started having to physically fight and defend myself and to protect myself. I watched like uh, Jean-Claude Van Damme movies and <laughs> <Yeah>. stuff. <laughs> like real deep. Real deep. In, in, in real life, that's not how fights work. No, that's real not life, they're, they're, it's painful and it's difficult. Many times I had to defend myself and mainly lost. And this, these are white students who were brutal to me. And in March of 1995, I was beaten so badly by a group of white students at my school that I missed the next two years of high school. I had fractures in my face. I had three spinal surgeries. Oh, my injuries were so severe. That moment changed the entire trajectory of my life. And what these, I've, I forgave those young Allah men. Allah. I forgave them. Just because you were with? There was no reason for them to do this. Day, like day, these day. students had picked on me forever and ever and ever. The day, the day it happened is March 8th of 1995. It's a pivotal day that changed my entire life. I see me and a brother named Laron who lived in my neighborhood. 
we see a group of, of students that we knew were like racist white students at our school. And it looked like they had just gotten into a fight with each other. And we, start, we literally started make. I've told this story all my life. We started making fun of them to ourselves, like saying, these, these, these fools that just fought each other. What they were doing was they were pumping themselves up, knowing that I had to walk through there to get to band class. So I had to walk through that crowd, but I, I had no idea they were there for me. It never occurred to me. I walk right into the middle of that crowd. They just surround me, begin punching me from every angle. I collapse onto the ground. They stomp on me, kick me. What felt like an hour may have taken 45 seconds. Yeah. Yeah. But 45 yeah. seconds of being punched and kicked changed my entire Feels life. Like forever. Yeah. And I was sent to the hospital. Uh, I, I missed the rest of that year of school. I missed my entire junior year of high school recovering from those surgeries. But had that not happened, at that moment, it was the most brutal, painful thing, and not just physically, emotionally. Yeah, I, I was diagnosed with post-traumatic stress disorder. I was wounded emotionally and physically. But what I, what I came to understand was that Allah used this painful moment to burn into me a heart for people who are hurting. From that moment forward, I, I was a good kid, but I never imagined being an activist. I never imagined being an advocate. I had other dreams for myself. What were they? Well, I, uh, I wanted to be like a, a sports agent or a, a, like I wanted to lead a sports team. Nice. Oh, wow. uh, I love music. I thought about being like a music executive, things that kids just dream of. Mm. That, I dreamed of getting out of that town and I dreamed of things that would get me out of that town. I never dreamed I would be an advocate for people. But after, after this assault happened, and there were, I could spend the next two hours telling Did you. Did anybody get charged for that? Nobody was charged. No, none of it was nobody charged. Nobody, this happened in school. Nobody was even suspended from school. Wow. This. Ambulance came and picked you up. You know, my, they called my mother from work. My mother rushed to the school. They should have called an ambulance. My mother rushed to the school, took me to the emergency room. And uh, I mean, I was literally for weeks, my body was black and blue. I could not walk or move. And, uh, and I was emotionally, as a, as a young boy, as a, pr as a proud young boy, I was shattered. What it did, it, I, listen, I still hate that it happened to me, but had it not happened to me, I don't know who I would be. Had this horrible moment, which lasted 45 seconds, and I told you, I, I forgave those kids before I even finished high school. And you went back to the school? I had to. It was the only school. You know, I lived in this little town. There was no other school for me to go to. So I had three spinal surgeries. I had to go through months of physical therapy. And I had to go back to this school if I wanted to graduate and leave. And so it changed me. It caused me to care about people that were experiencing oppression. It, care, it caused me to care about people who had experienced violence. To this day, I don't know that people would know me for the work that I've done for Palestinians. Like when I see people being brutalized, it, it triggers a, a, an old trauma in me. Wow. And of course, I've never experienced a fraction of what our sisters and brothers in Gaza are experiencing. No, I but I know what it's like to be brutalized. I know what it's like to have nobody stand up for you. For no reason. Yeah. Brother, and brother for, for, it's, it's quite interesting. Like we've, we've, we've spoken to other brothers and sisters in regards to something like this happening to them and it broke them. And, and subhanAllah, some, some have never recovered. What, what made it like for you, mashallah, for you to be able to come back and be sane and be not to break you. So what, what was the thought pattern? Because we have a lot of brothers and sisters currently that are being bullied and are going through this. But subhanAllah, we talk to them through our mentorship you know, programs that we run. And subhanAllah, they, they, they can't break out. What, what, what advice would you give? For any young people or anybody that is seeing this, I, I just want to be very transparent. I have no superpower. It did break me. I was completely shattered. I, this was at a time when I, I'm 44. And so in the mid 90s, I did not even know that suicide was an option. Like uh, that wasn't something that I knew that people did, but I knew I wanted to die. Like I did not want to live. 
There was a day I, I told you about my, my brother, my older brother, Jason. There was a day that I was in so much physical pain. I had my second spinal surgery failed and it caused like extreme catastrophic pain Allah. and nothing I would take would take it away. And my brother came in and he's a, I told you he's a big, strong guy. And my brother was crying and I begged my brother to knock me out. And he just, and it broke him. And we talked about this later and years later. Layla. I just begged him. I said, please do like punch me and knock me out. I was in that much pain. And so it did break me. Like I was completely shattered. I'll, I'll tell you, my mother, her consistent love helped me. My brother's support. I had a dear friend who's my, my, one of my best friends to this day named Willis, who would come and sit with me. And we would listen to music and watch movies. I couldn't even get out of the bed. And uh, his father, uh, he made any, no I told you, I had no father figure in my life. I didn't even really have a, a grandfather, an uncle. His father was a local pastor. I didn't know him as a pastor, a Christian pastor. But his father would just come and visit me. I knew him as my best friend's dad. Mm. And what I, what I did... I found myself wanting to be like him. The story I've always told for years is had, it had the man that came to visit me, had he been a guitar player, I would have wanted to be a guitar player. Had he, had he been, had, had he been at whatever he had been, I would want, and, but he was a pastor. Is that, is that because, Allah, he, is that that because he showed you compassion? Oh, he was the, I had never had a, a man in my life express care for me Love it. Wow. and and he was so human he would come and just talk to me he was the first man that would touch me and put his hand on my hand and he and he was the first person in my life that had ever prayed with me and he wow. would pray out loud with me and I my mother and I we were not active Christians my mother had considered Christianity but she did not raise us as Christians and so this man would pray with me and I found myself thinking like, if, if there is a God, I want to know God. If there is Hello. a God that cares me, cares for me, I want to know more. And so my introduction to God and to Christianity was through this man who was just my best friend's father. Hello. And, um, just to, just to touch on that, Allah Akbar, Allah. just to touch on that, the power of touch and the power of connection. I think oh man, it's, it it is it is an absolute like phenomena. Like we 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 use that ourselves as well. Like just a hug, man. When we when we when we met each other, we had never met before. We have never. But we met hugged each other we and, hugged and each touched each other. It's it's one of the beauties of Islam that's I think unique that other amen, people don't amen. experience. That as men, we are openly affectionate with each other. I mean, yeah. in a way that's that is counter to what people think of as masculine. Yes. We are, we are three masculine men together who hug each other, whom we may even kiss each other Amen. on the cheek. And, and, Amen. And, and it has nothing to do, it's not sexual, it's the, it, is, it, is, it is because we see each other as brothers. Amen. Amen. And so this, this man, he, he held my hand when I was in pain. And it, you know, it meant the world to me. And so, you know, the story is... So how old were you when you... How old were you then? I was 15, 15. And 15 and 16 as I went through this. And to this day, that probably is the low point of my life. I, I have experienced many trauma moments and traumatic moments, but I don't know that I was ever lower than I was during... That was almost 18 months of my life that um, I see now as almost like... Uh, an incubator. Mm, the where, hitting, hitting the iron. Yeah, where... Hitting the iron to get it hot. Absolutely. It, it yeah. was like, a, like being in a furnace. It, it, it broke me down. It, 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 it did rob my childhood of me. I see that moment as when I was a child and when I, be, when I was kind of forced to become a man. You remind me of the saying of Rumi. He says, the light enters where the wound is. That's right. My, my wife and I, we, uh, we uh, went in here in Istanbul uh, to see some Sufi men who are uh, whirling dervishes. Yes, yes. And they even had some of the teachings of Rumi there. It was actually very beautiful. 
it was actually like a really somber, it wasn't a celebration, it was like a somber moment. And um, no, I would not be a Muslim. I don't know how, this man, his name is Reverend Willis Polk. He's a Christian pastor. I don't know that I would be a Muslim had I not first been a Christian. And it was my introduction to prophets. It was my introduction to Jesus, peace be upon him. Peace you know, him. It, was, it was my introduction to sacred text. And so all of these things, he, this man invited me to attend Bible study in church. And so my introduction to begin seeing myself, even as a spiritual being, came through him. Allah. Were you a practicing Christian? Yes. Yeah, so not only was I a practicing Christian, uh, just two years later, this is, I think, unique. It, there are, I have learned, there are young Muslims who become imams early. But I became a Christian minister just at the age of 17. Wow. And so I started traveling and preaching as a young teenage preacher almost right away. And what, who were your mentors there? In that, in you know, dur during that period, this man, Reverend Willis Polk, was he was like the beginning and end for me. He was he was a father figure and a mentor. I would listen to uh, again. This was before podcasts. This was before YouTube. So I had cassette tapes. I would listen to cassettes of other preachers and pastors. At that time, though, I, I got a chance to tell a little bit of this story. When I was recovering from maybe my first surgery. Willis, my friend, who, I, who I'd known since kindergarten, it was his father that was the pastor, Willis brought me a copy of the autobiography of Malcolm X. Hello. And I, they, that may be the only book in my life that I have read more than once. Hello. And I was stuck in the bed for months and months. And uh, my mother bought me the movie X yeah, based on the life of Malcolm that. X. I love that movie. But I, even, even though I was embracing Christianity at this point, I saw myself in Brother Malcolm in so many ways. When he was incarcerated, he was known as, he was known as Red or Detroit Red. He was not a Muslim when he was first incarcerated. And he saw prison in very much the same way as I saw my bed. As he was broken in prison and I was broken in my bed. And it was in prison that he found God and, and, and found Allah, or Allah found him. And it was in my bed that I had this same experience. I, I identified with this, like being very, very low and believing that life could be better. I told this story, um, even, even though I was uh, becoming a Christian, me and a friend of mine also considered Islam. And for the very first time in my life, this is in 1996, before I was baptized as a Christian. In 1996, uh, we first went to a mosque for Juma prayer for the very first time. Oh, well. Wow. Here's, what, here's what's hilarious about it. There was no Google. And so we, we both, me and my friend Calvin, had read the autobiography of Malcolm X. And we knew that to be like Malcolm would be to be a Muslim. Love but her. we didn't know there were no mosques in our town that we lived in. Oh, wow. We lived the next town over had some, but there was no Google. So to find the mosque, we had to the kids who watch this won't even know what we're talking about. We had to look it up in the phone book. The yellow pages. Yeah, the yellow pages <laughs> of the phone book. I don't even remember. I may, we may have looked up mosque. I don't remember how we we found a local mosque in Lexington called Masjid Bilal. Bilal. Yeah, Master Bilal. I, I did not know who Bilal was. Oh, wow. Bilal. I did not know that this was a companion of the Prophet, peace be upon him. We knew none of this. This was a predominantly African-American mosque about 30 minutes from where we lived. We called the phone number in the Yellow Pages, and I think it was just the imam's home phone number. And he answers the phone. We tell him that we just read the autobiography of Malcolm X. And he was so smart. He, he knew what he could say to us. He said, listen, if you want to come up here during school on Friday, I will write you a note and it will excuse your absence. <laughs> and we were like, yes, yes, we can miss school to come see you. Yeah, well. For three straight Fridays, we went to Juma prayer on Fridays. We, we left school. 
we were so mischievous and we didn't have a Muslim community to be a part of. We didn't, under, we didn't understand even the prayers. Uh, it, like it was a difficult thing for us to relate to. When we realized that the school would let us leave early to go to prayer, but that they weren't checking our excuses, we just started skipping school on Fridays. <laughs> <laughs> you, you asked me to talk about yeah. You asked me to talk about failures. That was one of my early failures in Islam. Is that in, instead of fully embracing it, we were so mischievous. We just used it to skip school. And uh, I told our we're here in Istanbul speaking to leaders all over the world. And uh, I told the audience today that uh, part of me regretted now as I'm 44, I became, I'm, I became a Muslim at the age of 44 years old. I regretted that I could have become a Muslim at 16 and I missed 16 to 44. But I have uh, one of my imams in the United States is Imam Omar Suleiman. And, uh, he, my, he did the Shahada with my wife and I, we flew there to be with him in Dallas. And, uh, after we took Shahada, he, he leaned over and whispered in my ear. He said, oh, he said, brother, I have prayed for this for the past eight years. Allah, and Allah. I told him, I said, man, had you told me this eight years ago, I might have become a Muslim eight years ago. <laughs> and he said something to me that has made me not feel like I missed out. He said to me right there, right after we took Shahada, he said, Sean, no, it's the timing of Allah. I mean, and I mean. he said, uh, if it was meant to be when you were 16, it would have happened when you were 16. He said, but... Allah saw you and knew exactly what your life needed to be to lead you to this moment. It's flipped, alhamdulillah. Yes, and Everything's so... Everything's flipped, inshallah. Um, there's, a, there's a touching moment that I really want, and I'd love to, to express, because we, we all lose, you know, family members and brothers and sisters. We've lost friends, you know. Yes. I'd, I'd love what you, what would you say to your brother if he was here now? What, 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 what message would you give him? Oh, I would, so my brother and I both became not just ministers. We both became Christian pastors. Wow. And, and so oh, Islam was sorry. such a huge, uh, this, you should definitely leave that in the video. <laughs> we should, That's yeah. such a beautiful, but we're in the moment and uh, a, a very kind worker from the hotel we're in came in and saw that, oh, I think they're doing something and left. So, I'm, I feel so bad for him. Um, I, I would love to know, first, my brother would be supportive of me. Uh, more than anything, my, even though we both became Christian pastors, I don't know, that, I don't know if my brother would ever embrace Islam. I, I, it, it would be hard for me to imagine that. But when, when my brother passed away, I didn't know that I would embrace Islam. But... He was such a good big brother to me that he supported anything I did. And uh, I, I would only imagine my brother being supportive. I, I, would, I would imagine him telling me that he was proud of me. He always told me this. So, um, what would you say to him? What would you say to him right now? Oh, if you had the chance he was here right now, what would you say to him? What would I, you say I, to him would, right? I would want him to know my, my brother loved God. I, w I would just want him to know about the sweetness and the peace that I feel as a Muslim. I, I, would, I would just want to communicate to him in love. My intent would be just like Imam Omar Suleiman. My intent, Imam Omar has been my friend for 10 years, but he never attempted to make me into a Muslim. He never asked me to be a Muslim. Not once did he ask me Not to do once. this. Never, never. Even when I became a Muslim, he never pushed me at all. Never, and he never told me this is what he wanted for me. Allah Akbar. I wish, I wish I could just share with my brother uh, the stories that I've learned about our Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, that, are, that excite me. The stories that I've learned about his companions that I've learned even here while I've been in Istanbul. Um, my brother was curious. He was a learner. He went back late in life to get a, an advanced degree as a Christian pastor. Uh, he would be very inquisitive about these Allah things. Allah. I... Um, I, none of us fully know, uh, for all my life, I've called it heaven. Now I call it Jenna. <laughs> I, I, none of us fully know what it will be like. There are descriptions of it. Um, I still pray. I, I don't, I don't know, uh, who all will be there. It will, it, I pray that my brother will be there. May Allah unite us all there, And, um, but, uh, he was, he was such a deeply good man. Uh, he would really, he would tell me he was proud. 
and I would be excited to tell him what I'm learning. Yes, but he's, uh, I, lo I, I loved him dearly. And now uh, I, I want to tell people, do not miss the moment to love on your brother. Amen. Here I am. Uh, if, here I am. There's a, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Listen, there's an empty seat next to me. And listen, you should, anybody in your life that you love, don't make them guess how you feel about them. I, my brother knew that I loved him. I even, to his dying day, I loved him. I kissed him. I, but I, I wish that I had done, I wish he and I had taken adventures together. My brother was a camper, but I never went to camp with him. He was an adventurer, but I never took adventures with him. While your loved ones are here, inshallah, you don't know if they'll be here tomorrow. You don't know. I, please love on your mother, love on your brother, love on your friends. I, I regret deeply things that I wish I had said and done with him or while he was alive, but I was younger and dumber and more selfish. And uh, so, yes, if, if there are loved ones that you, you adore, don't make them guess that you adore them. Tell them, show them in every way. I want to touch base on your advocacy. Advocacy, yeah. yeah when, you, when, when did that become, you know, engulfed in everything that you do? I, be, I became... I, and what made you go online and all these things? I was really well, like I know. first became... I first started seeing myself as an activist when I returned back to high school, that senior year of high school, recovering from those surgeries. I started caring about injustice, not just my own injustice, uh, my mother and I sued the school that I attended. Oh, we sued did. the school system that we attended. We ultimately, my mother, who didn't have the budget to fund what we, we, we dropped these lawsuits. We lost every lawsuit, which was demoralizing for her. Eventually, I told my mother, I moved off to college later. I told her that I, even I wanted to move on with my life. Mm. When I moved to Atlanta in 1997 to go to college, no student there knew. This is a school for young black men. Over 3,000 young black men attend this university. It's where Martin Luther King went to school. No one knew what I had just endured. So you're really good at ac academic at school. So you got good scores to go into. I, uh, well, I was, I was an above average student. I, I think I was, I had an intellect, but high school had been brutal for me. Yeah. And when this, there was a man at this school named Mark Hatcher and uh, who I've gone back to think many times. I saw him just last year. He was an admissions officer at the school. I told him the story of what I had just endured. And um, Mark told me, he said, Sean, you don't even have the minimum grades to get a scholarship here. He said, the minimum to get a full scholarship or even a partial scholarship is like a 3.5 GPA. He said, you don't even meet that. But he said, uh, he said, I went to a program and he said, we're going to interview like 200 students for this, for these scholarships. He said, if you come and wait, I'll interview you. Brother Mark Hatcher, uh, we're now, I'm now old enough to where we're peers. Now he was a grown man then, but now he's, I'm in my forties. He's in his fifties. He made me wait about 12 hours. I love it. I was in line for almost 12 hours waiting to be interviewed for this scholarship. And he interviewed me and right there in the interview, he told me, he said, Sean, if there's one student that gets a scholarship off of my, off of his recommendation, I promise you, you'll get one. Wow. And I ended up getting a full scholarship that I did not deserve, did not earn based on my grades that covered my entire tuition there. And, uh, all and because he believed in you all because he, he heard my story and believed in me. And, uh, again, these men, the, these men that believed in me at different phases of my life helped make me. We have a saying, we have a saying, I believe in you, I will help you believe in you. Ah, that's beautiful, yes. He, no, that Mark Hatcher lived that. He, he believed in me and helped me believe in me. So did Reverend Willis Polk. When I moved to Atlanta in 1997, I was, I was actually not even fully recovered from my surgeries. So when I got there, I was still, I was still in pain physically. I was still wounded emotionally. And I realized like no one here knows what I just endured almost right away. I was not a leader in high school. 
This was this racist high school would not allow me to be a leader. The first week I was at this college, students began seeing me and embracing me as a leader. Wow. It changed my life. This was a, I went to a school that chewed black boys up and spit them out. And then I went to a college that was just meant for young black men. Wow. It was like a hospital for me. It, it was like an incubator. It was like a hospital that helped me heal. Two weeks after I got to Morehouse College, I was elected the president of my dormitory. Two years later, I was elected student government president of the entire university. I was the first sophomore to be elected student government president in almost 50 years. It was almost a role just for juniors and seniors. And I was elected as, as a teenager. And right away I became, again, this is before Twitter. This, MySpace did not exist yet. The internet barely existed. It is. So I was, to be a leader meant to be a speaker. It meant to be an organizer of people. And right away, my freshman year in college, I became an activist. Wow. Um, by my junior year in college. What was the first thing you organized, if you don't mind asking? Sure, sure. There, there were, all around the college, there were what we call housing projects, where the most impoverished people of Atlanta lived. And they were tearing these housing projects down. Uh, and they said that they were going to build businesses and apartments. But they tore these projects down and ultimately never built almost anything in their place. And we started advocating that the city, if you're going to tear down these homes, these people need somewhere to go. We started advocating for that. There was a, in 1998, this is a, a brutal story, but it, it, it connected with me. There was a man named James Byrd, who was a black man, who was lynched, who was tied to the back of a pickup truck Allah. and dragged in Jasper, Texas Allah. by white supremacists. He was walking along a road. They picked him up as if they were going to take him somewhere. And they tied this black man to the back of the truck and drove until it tore his body into literal pieces. This happened in 1998 in Texas, in the United States. How do you as a young black live with these kind of- Well, you, like, have, to, you have to understand. Like, 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 you have to, you have to understand. How, how, like, this was, the, again, this was before social media, but this was a viral, this was viral before social media made something viral. So the whole country was talking about it. So we began advocating as students that, because never in the history of America had white men who lynched a black man been charged, arrested, convicted, and sent to prison. So in the 1920s, 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, white men lynched black men, not by the dozens, but by the thousands. Over 5,000 black men were lynched in the United States, right, and not a single person was ever sent to prison for it. And so not because of me, but because of activists and organizers all over the United States, the men who killed James Byrd were arrested, were charged, were convicted, were sent to prison. And I don't, I don't believe in the death penalty, but several of the men that killed James Byrd were, were executed in Texas. Wow. And um, that was the first of its kind. Yeah, that, that was historic for the United States. Um, the next year I was student government president and it was the first case of police brutality I'd ever worked on. There was a young Muslim man named Amadou Diallo. Uh, he was an African immigrant who had moved to the Bronx in New York. A beautiful brother, he was 22 years old. He was about my age when I was in college. So smart, his mother was brilliant and they moved to New York for him to be advanced. The NYPD, the New York Police Department, saw him and, and said they thought he was a crime. He had never committed a crime a day in his life. He was the sweetest, most gentle human being. Amadou Diallo, a Muslim, shot and killed Amadou Diallo, shot him. The, the rock singer Bruce Springsteen has a song called 41 Shots. They shot Amadou Diallo 41 times on the doorstep of his home 
And they said when Amadou pulled out his wallet to show them, I'm not who you, whoever you think I am, that's not who I am. They said he pulled out a gun. It was his wallet. And they shot him 41 times. I, I eventually came to know his mother and his family. His mother, Katiatu Diallo, is a queen of a woman. And it was the first time that I ever was a part of protests and demonstrations for police brutality. We traveled to New York. It was the first time I'd ever traveled to a protest. And um, I learned a painful lesson. Again, this, is a, this was failure. I had never in my life fought so hard. We had just seen these men be responsible that killed James Byrd, be convicted. All of the police officers who murdered Amadou Diallo, all of them were charged. And we thought, that's it. These men will go to prison. Not a, not a single officer who killed Amadou, Amadou Diallo was ever held responsible. I don't know. Not one. Not, not one. one. They were charged. None of them were found, even though what they did was a grave injustice. If it happened today, uh, inshallah, maybe they would be convicted. Maybe. But, but in 1999, none of them were convicted. None of them were convicted. And it was a lesson for me that here was the lesson. Were we wrong to fight for justice? No. You fight for justice because it's the right thing to do. Were we wrong to protest, even though, even though these men weren't convicted? No, of course we were not wrong. You fight for these families that experience injustice. You fight for Gaza, whether you fight for Gaza today, even if the genocide doesn't end tomorrow, you fight because it's the right thing to do. And so we fought for Amadou Diallo. Our belief was that there would be justice. There was no justice. But to this day, his mother is still thankful that people stood up and, and, and stood up for her family. We didn't succeed with our goal, but we did what was right. And I, I'm, I have the peace of mind of knowing that as a teenager, as a student leader, that at that mo at formative moment in my life, I stood up for a family when it was necessary. For the past, that was 25 years ago. And for the past 25 years, the, some of the main work of my life is fighting against victims of police brutality, but victims of any kind of injustice. And I, I put the victims of this genocide in Gaza right alongside that. They are experiencing the worst injustice of my lifetime. I've never seen anything like it. And so it all, it all stems, though, from that, those early days of what I experienced. And... Uh, and you've, you've, been, you've been fighting ever since. I've tried, you know, and but people need to hear that I have probably fought for 500 families that have experienced the worst injustice. Maybe 10 of them have gotten justice. 10. What that means is 490 families that I fought for did not get the justice we wanted. But we have to fight for 491. 492, 493. That's why there's an ikhra. Yes. But That's at the end of that, justice will come with Allah <laughs> subhanahu wa ta'ala. No Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, on, on this, like, and I think we, we have to wrap it up because we haven't got much time and I know your time is so precious. Uh, I'd like to finish off in regards to, like, we know you've lost your social media following currently and, and all that. I mean, a couple of minutes, can you give us sort of the feelings that you felt with that? Because that was a very powerful voice for you to be able to you know, I remember watching you and seeing the messages come through saying, you know, with the warnings and all that. And yes. I've, I've been, I've been you know, an advocate, I've been watching you for a long time. May Allah bless you. And how did that make you feel? And, 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 and how do you, how you move forward on that, inshallah, as, as, as sort of yeah, like, to wrap it up? Like Andrew Tate got banned, but his still, content's still coming out. Obviously, he's got arrested. When you get banned at that level, like... How do you come back from that? Well, uh, le let me tell you that for when I was banned from Instagram, unlike many people, I had put almost all of my eggs into the Instagram basket. It was the primary place that I built community. Oh, wow. So I had o over 6 million followers. It was my primary hub for all the work that I did. I didn't have a YouTube channel. I barely used any of the other platforms. So this was my, this was my primary home. SubhanAllah. And so I... I told the audience here earlier, I spoke at Meta. The, the founder of Meta, Mark Zuckerberg, his wife gave a million dollars to my organization, the Grassroots Law Project. Like, the, I thought I was a protected person 
at Instagram. Even in September, I mean, in, in October and November, and December, executives at Meta would ask me to mediate conflicts that they were having with Palestinian users. They would like I was seen as somebody I thought that would never be banned from the platform. I, I, I thought I would be there forever. Love, wow. and love. I've never been suspended before. I'd never like I had never been in trouble with the platform before. And so when they banned me, not only did they ban me, they issued a lifetime ban. L listen, they they banned Donald Trump, but restored him. He is back. He's on their platforms. That's right. They they issued a lifetime ban of me. And at first I was so bitter about it because it, it wasn't me losing an account. It, they took a community that I had built from me. I raised tens of millions of dollars from that platform for charities all over the world. I was advocating for Gaza from that platform. And when I left, I was so bitter. But I want to tell anybody who sees this now, it took me months. It took me months of being bitter to get to what I'm about to tell you. I finally got to the place where I don't know if I would have become a Muslim had I not been banned from Instagram. Allah and let me Allah. tell you why. Allah. When I was banned Allah. from the platform, it took away all kinds of noise from my life, good and bad. I lost beautiful relationships and also removed all kinds of ugliness and hate. It, I was chugging, I was spending sometimes 16 hours a day on, on this platform. Wow. It seems it. It seems and it instantly, it was gone in an instant. Like it didn't slowly happen. I just logged in one day and they had banned me and I was never back again. I have come to believe that had I still been allowed on Instagram, I would probably still be doing what I was doing in November and December. I would probably have 10 million followers and I would probably not be a Muslim. Because I was banned, it allowed me to reconsider, who am I? Where am I? Where am I going? What am I? Because I, because I was banned, it caused me to consider who I want to be, where do I want to be? Here's, I said this from uh, a masjid Allah, Allah. in Istanbul called Ayub Sultan. It is the, mas is the masjid that honors the companion of our prophet, peace be upon him, Abu Ayub Al-Ansari. I said this from the floor of that masjid. If, if Meta or Instagram said, Sean, if you would just reject Islam, We'll bring you back. <laughs> I would not, I would not, if they, if they said, Sean, we will make you the CEO of Instagram. You can own Instagram, but you have to reject. If they, if they just said, you have to reject Palestinians. Allah. If, if Sean, if you have to apologize for what you said in defense of Palestinians, but we'll let you back. I would not take it. Allah, Allah, Allah. I would, I would rather be a Muslim. I love this. I would rather be a Muslim with no social media, with no following, with no supporters. And what, what Muslims told me, the day my wife and I became Muslims, someone at a Valley Ranch Islamic Center told me this. And now I, people tell me this all over the world. They said, Sean, you might have lost 6 million followers, but you gained 2 billion sisters and brothers all over the world. Welcome to the family, my brother. <laughs> but you, you remind me of, of watching Malcolm X and he's outside the police station and he does this and then the police officer goes, they're too much power for one, one man. Yes. No, that's, that's why they took the platform. And in November and December, my account was one of the three most viewed accounts in the world, more than any president in the world. Wow. And, and, too and much at, power that, at that too point, much power one man. my followers went from probably 90% non-Muslim to over 50% Muslim. This was before I became a Muslim. My followers, the top 10 cities of my followers were all American. By December, seven of the top 10 cities of my followers were all around the world. It was in, it was in Malaysia, it was in Amman, Jordan. You became global. Right. And yeah, so yeah. instantly, th this, this was too much for them. And so uh, I would not, I would not, I, I would not treat. <laughs> I'm, 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 we're finishing, we're wrapping up, we're wrapping up. It's, it's my fault, it's my fault. It's my fault. No, I'm back. We'll cut off soon. I told you, last question. I'm very quick. I'm very quick. I like very quick. I, I know, I, whether this is a part of the, the podcast, and I want you to know, like, no, like, I'm, uh, I'm so deeply content, uh, and I have so much peace as a Muslim. I'm frustrated about the world, 
but I have peace in my soul. And I, I would not I would not trade it for anything. Allah bless you. Allah bless you, man. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you man. for your time. Thank you. We don't forget us in your prayers. And alhamdulillah, like, you, like everyone's been telling you, you've got two billion family now. Yeah, thank this you This one so thing much. I'd like to end. We always end our podcast on an I am statement. For example, my I am statement is, I am a student that aims to be a benefit. Do you have an I am statement that we can just wrap this whole episode with, inshallah? Wow, that is, that's a profound thing to think about. You know, uh, I, I won't be long, but, you know, I, I, I have made a decision to primarily care about how Allah sees me. And for most of the past 10 years, in ways I didn't even understand, I deeply cared about what people in the world thought of me. And in part being removed from social media removes that thought. Um, you know, you know I, I am a man who cares deeply how Allah sees me from day to day to Allah day. Akbar. Allah. And, exactly. uh, Allah that's who I am. Thank you very Allah much for sharing. You. Thank you very much for sharing. Allah bless you. And thank you. Thank you for your being brother and thank you for sharing your story with us. Wallahi, it's been an honor. <laughs> yes. Yes. Allah, and sorry that, uh, sorry that we've, uh, we've irritated everybody. <laughs> 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 thank, thank you, you brothers. <laughs> thank you very yeah. much. Yes.